Okay, so welcome to part two of this video on long QT syndrome. In uh, the previous video, what we saw is that uh, an action potential occurring on the membrane of this neighboring, uh, neighboring cardiomyocyte is going to induce a slight depolarization of the uh, membrane potential across uh, its, this cardiomyocyte here. And that that slight depolarization will then lead to uh, the opening of these uh, voltage-gated sodium channels. And the alpha subunit of this voltage-gated sodium channel is coded for by uh, the gene NAV1.5, which is the uh, voltage-gated sodium channel that we find in cardiomyocytes. Okay, so what's going to happen is that that voltage-gated sodium channel is going to open... And that's going to allow sodium to come into the cell. So remember, sodium concentrations are usually much higher in the extracellular fluid than they are in the intracellular fluid. So you usually have much higher sodium concentration outside the cell than you do inside the cell. So uh, the concentration gradient favours the movement of sodium into the cell. Moreover, you have an electrical driving force here of... Uh, the, uh, ele the um, electrical potential across the membrane is negative. It, I mean, even, th even though we've slightly depolarized it here, it's still negative, which means that the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment is lower than the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment. Sodium has a positive charge, so it wants to go to areas of lower electrical potential. So both the electrical gradient and the concentration gradient favour the movement of sodium into the cell. So when you open this voltage-gated sodium channel, what's going to happen is you're going to get the movement of sodium ions into the cell. And that, those sodium ions carry a positive charge. So overall, you are now moving sodium, a uh, positive charge into the cell. And that causes a steep uh, and very rapid depolarization of the electrical potential across the cardiomyocyte. So here's our rapid depolarization. And this rapid depolarization phase here is known as phase zero of the cardiac action potential. So this is phase zero. Okay, and these voltage-gated sodium channels up here, they remain open for a certain amount of time, and then they close. Okay, and at the point at which they close, the general amount by which they have depolarized the membrane is they've generally depolarized up to around plus 20 millivolts. Now, I want to stress that they are not voltage inactivated. They inactivate after a certain amount of time. So, um, after a certain amount of time, these voltage-gated sodium channels close, and by the time they, have, they actually close, they have achieved a certain amount of depolarization, and generally, they manage to depolarize the cell up to plus 20 millivolts. Now, uh, what happens is that you get what's known as an inward transient potassium current happening next. So the next phase of the cardiac action potential is, the, uh, is this inward transient um, outward current of potassium. And basically, uh, the potassium is conducted through uh, two types of potassium channels. So let me draw these in here. So voltage-gated potassium channels. So here are two of these voltage-gated... Well, here's one of them at the moment. Now, voltage-gated potassium channels differ in structure from voltage-gated sodium channels. In the case of voltage-gated sodium channels, uh, a single polypeptide makes up all four of these cylindrical domains here. So it's a single polypeptide. Whereas in the case of potassium channels, um, these uh, four cylinders here, they are which make up the pore-forming unit, those are separate polypeptides. So, uh, in the intracellular aspect, they all have what are known as a T1 tetramization domain. So, each one, of these uh, each one of these four polypeptides will have a tetramization domain, and basically, these tetramization domains will bind together to make a tetramer, uh, and that's what holds together this uh, potassium channel. Okay, um, you also can have uh, beta subunits bound to these tetramization domains. So I'll draw some of these beta subunits like so. Um, <clears throat> and basically, these four subunits that make up the pore forming unit, those are known as alpha subunits, and these subunits down here are known as beta subunits. Okay, so this overall is a voltage-gated potassium channel. And there are two types of voltage-gated potassium channels which are going to open at this stage of the... Of the um, of the um, action potential. One 
is uh, made up of uh, a homotetramer of KV 1.4 subunits. So that means that all four of these alpha subunits here are made uh, of polypeptides which are uh, synthesized from the KV 1.4 gene. So KV 1.4 homotetramers are, um, are important. In addition, uh, another uh, type of voltage-gated potassium channel that's important in this stage is a heterotetramer in this case, and it's a heterotetramer of KV, uh, oh yes, sorry, I'll bring this down here, KV 4.2 and KV 4.3. Okay, so uh, that means that two of the subunits will be of this KV 4.2 type, and the other two will be KV 4.3. So basically, uh, the way that they are arranged is if I draw this channel from the top, like so, what you'll have is two KV4.2s, and they'll be diagonally opposite each other. So these are, let's say, the KV4.2s, and the KV4.3s will make up what's left. So you'll have two KV4.3 alpha subunits, and they'll uh, make up what's left in this poor forming subunit. Right, and then you can also have these beta subunits, which will be bound to the tetramization domains, which are on the cytosolic sides of each of these proteins. Okay, so these two types of potassium channels become activated in this upstroke of the action potential. In this phase zero, they become activated, and what they now do is they open. Now, when they open... Uh, what they're going to do is allow potassium to move through. They are voltage-gated potassium channels. So I'm just going to colour in the voltage-gated potassium channel. Uh, so we'll colour it in orange. So this is our voltage-gated potassium channel. And basically, uh, potassium concentration is much higher on uh, the intracellular in the intracellular compartment than it is in the extracellular um, compartment. So the concentration driving force is driving potassium out. You also have to now consider that the uh, electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is now plus 20 millivolts, which means that the intracellular compartment is more, has a higher electrical potential than the extracellular compartment, and it's higher by 20 millivolts. So, potassium has a positive charge, so it wants to go to areas of lower electrical potential. So it would like now to go to the extracellular compartment. So the concentration uh, differences um, favour the movement of potassium out of this channel, and also the electrical gradient across the cell now is plus 20 millivolts, so that also favours the movement of potassium out. So when these channels open, either these KV1.4 homotetramers, where all four of these are exactly the same, as I've drawn here, as I've suggested here, or KV4.2 and KV4.3 heterotetramers, uh, where you have two KV4.2 subunits and KV two KV4.3 subunits in the, uh, as far as alpha subunits are concerned. And of course, the type of voltage-gated potassium channel it is depends on the alpha or alpha subunits rather than really on these beta subunits. Okay, at least as far as naming it is concerned. So, these conduct potassium out. So we're now moving positive charge out of the cell. So that's going to favour the repolarization of the cell because it's going to reduce the electrical potential in the intracellular compartment and raise the electrical potential in the extracellular compartment. So it's going to make this one, it's going to reduce uh, the size of this one, the intracellular electrical potential relative to the extracellular electrical potential. So what happens basically is that the electrical potential goes back down. However, this current is known as the outward, uh, the transient outward current. It's often known as ITO for outward, sorry, the current, I for current, transient outward, because it's a transient outward current. Uh, and it stops really quickly. So these channels activate, and then they close again, and they cause this tiny little bit here, which is phase one of the action potential. Okay, right, so they're responsible for that little blip in the cardiac action potential. Now, the next important channel is what are known as L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. 
Okay, so to understand the next portion of the action potential, we need to look at these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, and we also need to look at the delayed rectifier potassium channels. So, uh, let me draw you an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. So we'll put it in here. Again, L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, they consist of uh, four... Um, well, they, consi they consist like the voltage-gated sodium channels. They consist of uh, four domains, but it's a single polypeptide that is coding for all of these four domains. So they differ from the potassium channels, basically. The potassium channels, it, you have four polypeptides coding for each one of these alpha subunits, whereas in the voltage-gated sodium channel and the voltage-gated calcium channel, the pore-forming unit is made by a single polypeptide which has four domains, one, two, three, and four. Okay, all right, so that's the pore-forming subunit. And basically, there are many different uh, types of uh, this pore-forming subunit, which is also known as the alpha subunit of a voltage-gated calcium channel. And if you are of the KV, CAV1 uh, type, then you are known as an L-type of voltage-gated calcium channel. So basically, the type of voltage-gated calcium channel that you are making is completely determined by what alpha subunit you use, which is this pore-forming unit, basically. And there are many different types of uh, alpha subunits uh, which are coded for by genes in the genome. And basically, there are four genes which are all counted as being in the CAV1 family, the ca voltage-gated calcium channel, first family, basically, and they are CAV 1.1 to CAV 1.4, so you have CAV 1.1, CAV 1.2, CAV 1.3, CAV 1.4, and all four of those genes code for alpha subunits, okay, and all of them are grouped together as the CAV 1 family. And it's all of those alpha subunits are counted as L types. So if you have one of those four alpha subunits as your alpha subunit of your voltage gated calcium channel, then your voltage gated calcium channel is known as an L type voltage gated calcium channel. Okay, so we'll color this alpha subunit of the voltage gated calcium channel in pink. So here it is. So this is an L type voltage gated calcium channel. Okay, and Voltage-gated calcium channels don't just consist of the alpha subunit, they have a whole bunch of auxiliary subunits. So they have a gamma subunit here, so this is the gamma subunit. Uh, then they have a beta subunit down here, uh, and they have what's known as the alpha-2 delta subunit here. So this box in the extracellular uh, portion is alpha-2, and this sort of stick holding it in the membrane is the delta subunit. So that overall is the alpha-2 delta subunit, and I apologise, it's a little squashed here. There's the voltage-gated calcium channel. So the important take-home message is that we have an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel here. Okay, uh, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.